candidates. We look forward to hearing you articulate your policies and your positions, as well as your visions and your values. So, let's begin. We're calling this opening segment Achieving Prosperity, and central to that is jobs. There are two economic realities in America today. There's been a record six straight years of job growth, and new census numbers show incomes have increased at a record rate after years of stagnation. However, income inequality remains significant, and nearly half of Americans are living paycheck to paycheck. Beginning with you, Secretary uh, Clinton, why are you a better choice than your opponent to create the kinds of jobs that will put more money into the pockets of American workers? Well, thank you, Lester, and thanks to Hofstra for hosting us. The central question in this election is really what kind of country we want to be and what kind of future we'll build together. Today is my granddaughter's second birthday, so I think about this a lot. First, we have to build an economy that works for everyone, not just those at the top. That means we need new jobs, good jobs, with rising incomes. I want us to invest in you. I want us to invest in your future. That means jobs in infrastructure, in advanced manufacturing, in innovation and technology, clean renewable energy, and small business, because most of the new jobs will come from small business. We also have to make the economy fairer. That starts with raising the national minimum wage and also guarantee, finally, equal pay for women's work. I also want to see more companies do profit sharing. If you help create the profits, you should be able to share in them, not just the executives at the top. And I want us to do more to support people who are struggling to balance family and work. I've heard from so many of you about the difficult choices you face and the stresses that you're under. So let's have paid family leave, earn sick days. Let's be sure we have affordable childcare and debt-free college. How are we gonna do it? We're gonna do it by having the wealthy pay their fair share and close the corporate loopholes. Finally, we tonight are on the stage together, Donald Trump and I. Uh, Donald, it's good to be with you. We're going to have a debate where we are talking about the important issues facing our country. You have to judge us. Who can shoulder the immense, awesome responsibilities of the presidency? Who can put into action the plans that will make your life better? I hope that I will be able to earn your vote on November 8th. Secretary Clinton, thank you. Mr. Trump, the same question to you. It's about putting money, more money, into the pockets of American workers. You have up to two minutes. Thank you, Lester. Uh, our jobs are fleeing the country. They're going to Mexico. They're going to many other countries. You look at what China is doing to our country in terms of making our product. They're devaluing their currency, and there's nobody in our government to fight them. And we have a very good fight, and we have a winning fight, because they're using our country as a piggy bank to rebuild China and many other countries are doing the same thing. So we're losing our good jobs, so many of them. When you look at what's happening in Mexico, a friend of mine who builds plants said it's the eighth wonder of the world. They're building some of the biggest plants anywhere in the world, some of the most sophisticated, some of the best plants. With the United States, as he said, not so much. So Ford is leaving. You see that, their small car division leaving thousands of jobs, leaving Michigan, leaving Ohio, they're all leaving, and we can't allow it to happen anymore. As far as child care is concerned and so many other things, I think Hillary and I agree on that. Uh, we probably disagree a little bit as to uh, numbers and amounts and what we're going to do, but perhaps we'll be talking about that later. But we have to stop our jobs from being stolen from us. We have to stop our companies from leaving the United States, and with it, firing all of their people. All you have to do is take a look at carrier air conditioning in uh, Indianapolis. They left, fired 1,400 people. They're going to Mexico. So many, hundreds and hundreds of companies are doing this. We cannot let it happen. Under my plan, I'll be reducing taxes tremendously, from 35% to 15% for companies, small and big businesses. That's going to be a job creator like we haven't seen since Ronald Reagan. It's going to be a beautiful thing to watch. Companies will come, they will build, they will expand, new companies will start, and I look very, very much forward to doing it. We have to renegotiate our trade deals, and we have to stop 
these countries from stealing our companies and our jobs. Secretary Clinton, would you like to respond? Well, I think that trade is... Okay. So uh, we do indeed need jobs. And part of the reason we have lost jobs is certainly on account of NAFTA. And while Secretary Clinton supported NAFTA, Bill Clinton signed NAFTA, uh, Donald Trump was actually busy offshoring his own jobs. Uh, in fact, every manufactured product that Donald Trump markets is an offshored um, uh, manufactured item. So when it comes to offshoring jobs, Donald Trump knows all about that because he's been doing it. In fact, he even advised that companies close their factories, move somewhere else in order to then come back and be able to push lower wages on the workers. And in fact, that is what NAFTA has accomplished, not only uh, losing us well over a million jobs, some say as much as three and four million, but also uh, putting downward pressure on wages. So we're actually calling for the antidote to NAFTA. And my administration would create a Green New Deal, like the New Deal that got us out of the Great Depression. So this is not uh, rocket science, this is not a hypothetical, this is something that we do. It calls for investing in people, investing in the real economy. We call for 20 million good wage, living wage jobs that will transition us to 100% clean renewable energy, a healthy and sustainable food system, as well as public, energy efficient, renewably powered transportation, and restoring our ecosystems. This revives our economy. It turns the tide on climate change. It actually revives our health. We save so much money. Uh, from improved health, that that alone is enough to pay the costs of the Green New Deal. And finally, achieving 100% renewable energy by 2030 enables us to make the wars for oil obsolete, which in turn puts hundreds of billions of dollars into true security here at home. Our country's in deep trouble. We don't know what we're doing when it comes to devaluations and all of these countries all over the world, especially China, they're the, the best, the best ever at it. What they're doing to us is a very, very sad thing. So we have to do that. We have to renegotiate our trade deals. And Lester, they're taking our jobs, they're giving incentives, they're doing things that frankly we don't do. Uh, let me give you the example of Mexico. They have a VAT tax, we're in a different system. When we sell into Mexico, there's a tax when they sell in automatic, 16% approximately. When they sell into us, there's no tax. It's a defective agreement. It's been defective for a long time, many years, but the politicians haven't done anything about it. Now, in all fairness to uh, Secretary Clinton, yes, is that okay? Good. I want you to be very happy. It's very important to me. But in all fairness to Secretary Clinton, when she started talking about this, it was really very recently. She's been doing this for 30 years. And why hasn't she made the agreements better? The NAFTA agreement is defective just because of the tax and many other reasons, but just because of the tax. Let me interrupt at a moment. But Secretary Clinton and others, politicians, should have been doing this for years. Not right now because of the fact that we've created a movement. They should have been doing this for years. What's happened to our jobs and our country and our economy generally is, look, we owe $20 trillion. We cannot do it any longer, Lester. Back to the question, though, how do you bring back, specifically bring back jobs? American manufacturers, how do you make them bring the jobs back? Well, the first thing you do is don't let the jobs leave. The companies are leaving. I could name, I mean, there are thousands of them. They're leaving. <coughs> They're leaving in bigger numbers than ever. And what you do is you say, fine. So again, on this question of how we bring the jobs back, um, you know, Donald Trump, you know, has been leading the pack in taking his jobs overseas. So perhaps he'll uh, bring that knowledge uh, in, into uh, the presidency. Let's hope he doesn't have a chance to do that. Um, but in terms of bringing the jobs back, this is why we call for the right to a job, why we call for a Green New Deal. Uh, we also call for a tax system in which we are taxing overseas profits. Right now, the trade agreements actually give tax advantages to corporations that take their jobs overseas. So yes, we do need to renegotiate these, um, these trade agreements, not to create 
uh, a um, trade barriers, but rather to create trade based on what works for workers on both sides of the border, what will protect our environment, what will protect our health. We need trade agreements that are for people, not for boosting corporate profits. Gee, I, I hope it does collapse because then I can go in and buy some and make some money. Well, it did collapse. That's called nine, business, by the way. Nine million people, nine million people lost their jobs, five million people lost their homes, and $13 <coughs> trillion dollars in family wealth was wiped out. Now, we have come back from that abyss, and it has not been easy. So we're now on the precipice of having a potentially much better economy, but the last thing we need to do is to go back to the policies that failed us in the first place. Independent experts have looked at what I've... So let's talk about where these policies came from that led to the Wall Street meltdown. Uh, in fact, this was a consequence of Wall Street deregulation that laid the groundwork for the waste, fraud, and abuse on Wall Street, for the predatory lending, for the um, unethical bundling of these insecure investment packages and their peddling to unsuspecting consumers. That grew directly out of Wall Street deregulation, which was brought to us by none other than Bill Clinton with the support of Hillary Clinton. So that's why, you know, another Clinton in the White House is not the solution to the economic crisis that not only uh, is throwing people under the bus, but is also leading to the right-wing extremism, like Donald Trump and others, which is very much a response to the economic hardships created by that Wall Street meltdown. And Hillary Clinton, remember, conti continues to be a good friend to the big banks, uh, has brought in, you know, $600 thousand dollars in uh, uh, in speaking fees to the big banks alone and still refuses to uh, reveal the content of those speeches so remember don't just listen to the talk look at the walk uh, let's not go down that road again thank you what got us in trouble in the first place. Mr. Trump, she talks exactly. about solar panels. Uh, we invested in a solar company, our <clears throat> country. That was a disaster. They lost plenty of money on that one. Now, look, I'm a great believer in all forms of energy, but we're putting a lot of people out of work. Our energy policies are a disaster. Our country is losing so much in terms of energy, in terms of paying off our debt. You can't do what you're looking to do with 20 <clears throat> trillion in debt. The Obama administration, from the time they've come in, is over 230 years worth of... So uh, let's be clear, that loan guarantee program to support uh, clean renewable energy uh, is actually in the black. There was uh, one transient loss that Donald Trump was referring to, but the program on the whole is enormously successful because renewable energy uh, is where it's at. It's also where the money is at. It is creating jobs at 12 times the rate of the rest of the economy right now. Jobs in solar uh, and in wind in particular are growing very fast. People know that this is the right thing to do, uh, and this is where the new economy lies. I might also say this is where our survival lies because the science Science is very clear now. Uh, in fact, a report last week, this uh, oil change international report, is that we have 17 years actually to zero out fossil fuels. Uh, not only are they deadly for our health, but they are deadly for our climate. And the day of catastrophic impact is coming closer. So this is not something to think about for the future. This is a state of emergency. Our uh, administration, a green administration, will declare a climate emergency, uh, the emergency that we are in, and that will move to create the jobs that we need right now. So people in the fossil fuel industry are not going to be out of a job, you're going to be into a far better job. In fact, it's the fossil fuel workers right now who are really on um, in the target hairs of the terrible health impacts. Their risk of dying on the job, in fact, is 700% higher the minute they walk in the door of that refinery or that fracking site or get in a uh, truck to drive, to drive the fuel. So we got jobs, lots more jobs, and jobs that are good for you, for the economy, and for the planet. I think it is a part of it, and I've said what I'm going to do. I'm going to have a special prosecutor. 
We're going to enforce the trade deals we have, and we're going to hold people accountable. When I was Secretary of State, we actually increased American exports globally 30%. We increased them to China 50%. So I know how to really work to get new jobs and to get exports that help to create more new jobs. Right. Well, you haven't done it in 30 years or 26 years. Well, I, I've wanted. been a senator. You haven't Donald, done it. And you I done. have been a and Secretary of State, and I have Your done. husband signed well, NAFTA, which was one of the worst things that ever happened well, to the manufacturing your industry. That is your you go to New England, you go to Ohio, Pennsylvania, you go anywhere you want, Secretary Clinton, and you will see devastation where manufacturing is down 30, 40, sometimes 50 percent. NAFTA is the worst trade deal maybe ever signed anywhere, but certainly ever signed in this country. And now <clears throat> you want to approve Trans-Pacific Partnership. You were so let's just remember as Donald Trump is railing against Hillary Clinton, for her support for NAFTA. Uh, let's just remember that uh, Donald Trump himself has offshored his jobs, encouraged other companies to do so, and suggested how they might do that in such a way as to lower uh, wages for their workers. So, um, uh, you know, uh, you need to take what he says with a grain of salt. Um, it's very important that we go back and renegotiate NAFTA, uh, that we do, in fact, end these incentives that currently exist, tax and insurance incentives that are part of these trade deals that encourage people to offshore. But we need to develop our jobs here. We need a productive economy here. That's why we call for investing in American jobs and in our uh, Green New Deal, which will create the right to a job for every American who is ready to go to work. We have a full-time job for you, uh, not only in uh, small businesses, also worker cooperatives and nonprofits. And in addition, <clears throat> we call for, uh, for ending student debt. Uh, and this too is one of the ways to restore our jobs and our economy. We have an entire generation of young people right now who are locked into predatory student loan debt without a way to get out of it, having largely uh, low wage, temporary insecure jobs that have come back. Uh, we need to create those good jobs. And part of the way we do that is by unleashing young people from this debt. Democrats and Republicans decided to bail out Wall Street, the crooks who crashed the economy with their waste, fraud, and abuse. They came up with $16 trillion to bail out Wall Street. If they could bail out the crooks who crashed the economy, it's time to bail out the young people who are held hostage by this unfair student loan debt and by an economy uh, that is on the skids. This is the stimulus package of our dreams, to unleash the people who are trained, they're ready to go, and to create the new economy of the 21st century. Of new jobs. But <coughs> regulations, you are going to regulate these businesses out of existence. When I go around, Lester, I tell you this, I've been all over. And when I go around, despite the tax cut, the thing the things that business as a people like the most <coughs> is the fact that I'm cutting regulation. You have regulations on top of regulations, and new companies cannot form, and old companies are going out of business, and you want to increase the regulations and make them even worse. I'm going to cut regulations, well, but I'm going to cut taxes big league, and you're going to raise taxes big league. Okay. End of story. Let me get you to pause right there, because we're going to yes, move, well, into, the, we're going to move that, into the next segment. We're going to talk that taxes. Can't, that can't be left Please, to stand. Take, take 30 you know, seconds, I, I, I kind on. of assumed that there would be a lot of these charges and claims and so Facts. we have taken uh, the home page of my website hillaryclinton.com and we've turned it into a fact checker so if you want to see in real time uh, what the facts are please go and take a look because and take a look at mine also not you'll see. add a penny to the debt and your plans would add five trillion dollars <coughs> to the debt what I have proposed would cut regulations and streamline them for small businesses. What I have proposed would be paid for by raising taxes on the wealthy because they have made all the gains in the economy 
And I think it's time that the wealthy and corporations paid their fair share to support this. Well, you just opened the next segment. Well, look, could I just finish that? I think I should. You go to her website. You take a look at her website. She's going to raise taxes $1.3 trillion. And look at her website. You know what? It's no different than this. She's telling us how to fight ISIS. Just go to her website. She tells you how to fight ISIS on her website. I don't think General Douglas MacArthur would like that too much. The next segment will continue well, on the subject Well, at least I have a plan to fight ISIS. No, no, you're telling the enemy everything you want to do. No, we're not. See, you're no, telling the not. enemy everything you yeah. want to do. We no wonder you've fighting. been fighting, no wonder you've been fighting ISIS Folks. your entire adult life. Folks, well, that, that's me, a, that's, me, go to the, please, the fact checkers, get Folks, to work. you are unpacking a lot here, and we're still in the issue of uh, achieving prosperity. And I want to talk about the taxes. <coughs> the fundamental difference between the two of you concerns the wealthy. Secretary Clinton, you're calling for a tax increase in the wealthiest Americans. I'd like you to further defend that. And Mr. Trump, you're calling for tax cuts for the wealthy. I'd like you to defend that. And this next two-minute answer goes to you, Mr. Trump. Well, I'm really calling for major jobs because the wealthy are going to create tremendous jobs. They're going to expand their companies. They're going to do a tremendous job. I'm getting rid of the carried interest provision. And if you really look, it's not a tax. It's really not a great thing for the wealthy. It's a great thing for the middle class. It's a great thing for companies to expand. And when these people are going to put billions and billions of dollars into companies, and when they're going to bring two and a half trillion dollars back from overseas when they can't bring the money back because politicians like Secretary Clinton won't allow them to bring the money back because the taxes are so onerous and the bureaucratic red tape so what is so bad. So what they're doing is they're leaving our country and they're, believe it or not, leaving because taxes are too high and because some of them have lots of money outside of our country and instead of bringing it back and putting the money to work because they can't work out a deal to, and everybody agrees it should be brought back, instead of that, they're leaving our country to get their money because they can't bring their money back into our country because of bureaucratic red tape, because they can't get together. Because we have a, pre we have a president that can't sit them around the table and get them to approve something. And here's the thing, Republicans and Democrats agree that this should be done. Two and a half trillion. I happen to think it's double that. It's probably five trillion dollars that we can't bring into our country, Lester. And with a little leadership, you'd get it in here very quickly, and it could be put to use on the inner cities and lots of other things, and it would be beautiful. But we have no leadership. And honestly, that starts with Secretary Clinton. All right, you have two minutes on the same question to defend tax increases on the wealthiest American Secretary Clinton. I, I have a feeling that by the end of this evening, I'm going to be blamed for everything that's ever happened. Why not? Why not? Yeah, why not? <laughs> jo you know, just, just, just join, uh, join the debate by uh, saying more crazy things. Now, let me it, say There's this. nothing crazy is about not letting our companies case. bring their money it, back into okay, their this country. Is, this is uh, Secretary Clinton's two minutes, yes. please. Yeah, well, let's start the clock again, Lester. Um, we've looked at your tax proposals. I don't see changes in the corporate tax rates or the kinds of proposals you're referring to that would cause the repatriation, bringing back of money that's stranded overseas. I happen to then you support didn't that. I happen, to, I happen to support that in a way that will actually work to our benefit. But when I look at what you have proposed, you have what is called now the Trump loophole because it would so advantage you and the business you do. You've proposed a, an name? approach First that ever. has a $4 this is, uh, this billion is dollar tax <coughs> benefit for your family. And when you look at what much, you are proposing, it is, sure as I said, trumped up, trickle down. Trickle down did not work. It got us into the mess we were in in 2008 and 9. Slashing taxes on the wealthy hasn't worked, and a lot of really smart, wealthy people know that. And they are saying, hey, we need to do more to make the contributions we should be making to rebuild the middle class. I don't think top-down works in America. I think building the middle class, investing in the middle class, making college debt-free so more young people can get their education, helping people refinance their tax, their, their debt from college at a lower rate. Those are the kinds of things that will really boost the economy. Broad-based, inclusive growth is what we need in America, not more advantages for people at the very top. 
Mr. Trump, what's up? Typical politician. So, um, just to be clear, Donald Trump, in fact, uh, did propose uh, major cuts to corporate taxes and also, I believe, eliminating the inheritance tax. So he is, in fact, talking about major cuts uh, in taxes for the wealthy. And I also want to clarify that Democrats and Republicans both have a history of cutting taxes, um, cutting taxes on the wealthy. Bush provided trillions of dollars uh, in the Bush tax cuts, of tax cuts for the wealthy. And uh, Barack Obama then, to some people's surprise, went on to make the temporary Bush tax cuts for the rich permanent. So uh, both, his, both parties have a history of giving it away uh, to the very wealthy and shifting the tax base from corporations and the wealthy onto the middle class and working people. So that needs to be reversed and we call for increasing the what I call the aristocracy tax because America was not supposed to have an aristocracy yet wealth has been so enormously concentrated into a few hands to where 22 billionaires now have as much as 50% of the American population. So we need an inheritance tax. <clears throat> we need a more steeply graduated progressive income tax so that the super rich are paying more and are paying their fair share up at at least the 55 to 60% level. Um, in addition uh, to a fair tax structure and investing in the American people, uh, we need a health care system that gets health care off the backs of everyday people, families, and particularly small businesses. And we can do that with a Medicare for All health insurance plan that uh, provides health care to everyone. Uh, we also call for, as I mentioned before, ending student debt and making public higher education free. It pays for itself seven to one. For every dollar we put in, we get back seven dollars in return. So this is a very effective investment in our economy, in our future, and in the generation that will lead us forward uh, into the economy of the 21st century. Billion dollars a year. You know what that is? That means who's negotiating these <coughs> trade deals? We have people that are political hacks negotiating our trade deals. The IRS says uh, the audit of your taxes, uh, it's, you're perfectly free to release uh, your taxes during an audit. And so the question does the public's right to know outweigh your personal? Well, I told you, I will release <coughs> them as soon as the audit. Look, I've been under audit almost for 15 years. I know a lot of wealthy people that have never been audited. I said, you get audited? I get audited almost every year. And in a way, I should be complaining. I'm not even complaining. I don't mind it. It's almost become a way of life. I get audited by the IRS. But other people don't. I will say this. Uh, we have a situation in this country that has to be taken care of. I will release my tax returns against my lawyer's wishes. When she releases her 33,000 emails that have been deleted, as soon as she releases them, I will release, I will release my tax returns. And that's against my lawyers. They say, don't do it. I will tell you this. No, in fact, watching shows, to reading the papers, almost every lawyer says, you don't release your returns until the audit's complete. When the audit's complete, I'll do it. But I would go against them if she releases her So it's negotiable? It's not negotiable. No, let her release the email. Why did she delete 33,000? Well, I'll let her ask that, but let me just uh, admonish the audience one more time. There was an agreement. We did ask you to be silent, so it would be helpful for us. Secretary Clinton. Well, I think you've just seen another example of bait and switch here. Um, for 40 years, everyone running for president has released their tax returns. You can go and see nearly, I think, 39, 40 years of our tax returns, but everyone has done it. We know the IRS has made clear there is no prohibition on releasing it when you're under audit. So you've got to ask yourself, why won't he release his tax returns? And I think there may be a couple of reasons. First, maybe he's not as rich as he says he is. Second, maybe he's not as charitable <coughs> as he claims to be. Third, we don't know all of his business dealings, but we have been told through investigative reporting that he owes about $650 million to Wall Street and foreign banks. Or maybe he doesn't want the American people, all of you watching tonight, to know that he's paid nothing in federal taxes because the only years that anybody's ever seen 
were a couple of years when he had to turn them over to state authorities when he was trying to get a casino license, and they showed he didn't pay any <coughs> federal income tax. So that makes if he's smart. paid zero, that means zero for troops, zero for vets, zero for schools or health. <coughs> And I think probably he's not uh, all that enthusiastic about having the rest of our country see uh, what the real reasons are, because it must be something really important, even terrible, that he's trying to hide. And the financial disclosure statement, they don't give you the tax rate. They don't give you all the details that tax returns would. And it just seems to me that this is something that the American people deserve to see, and I have no reason to believe that uh, he's ever going to release his tax returns because there's something he's hiding. And we'll guess. We'll keep guessing at what it might be that he's hiding. Uh, but I think the question is... I think they're both right. I think the American people deserve disclosure. Uh, instead of their uh, arguing about who is the bigger corporate crook, I think they all need to um, just level with the American people. I think uh, the American people do deserve to know what Hillary Clinton was doing uh, on, with her time while on the company payroll. And if half of her emails were declared um, private while working a very busy job for the Secretary of State, um, you know, that's an issue. If half of your emails on the job or are for your personal interest, that's an issue. What we know about the Hillary's dealings with the Prince of Bahrain arming uh, the, uh, the tyrant uh, with a history of uh, human rights abuses, uh, providing a Russian corporation with 20% of the U.S. uranium supply is of concern. But on the other hand, what we know about Trump's dealings uh, his businesses are extremely of concern, uh, where he, for example, uh, with this uh, investigative report from Newsweek, um, is involved in his business with the family of an Iranian involved in uh, laundering money for the Iranian military. So Donald Trump appears to have a vast network of extremely unsavory uh, and illegal connections that the American people deserve to know about. That may be why he's not releasing his tax returns. I think the American people deserve to know. But beyond that, we also deserve a politics of integrity. What you hear in their discussions here about what they're trying to hide uh, is a, a merger of the economic and political elite that does not serve the American people, that does not serve uh, the half of Americans who are struggling to stay out of poverty, does not serve the African Americans who are struggling uh, against police violence and to stay out of the uh, racist prison system. We need a politics of integrity where our government is not being funded by the big banks, the predatory uh, fossil fuel companies and the war profiteers who are subsidizing their campaigns, who provide the support for the Democratic and Republican parties. I'm the only candidate in this race that does not take money from lobbyists. I don't take money, <coughs> excuse me, from corporate interests. And I do not take money from uh, super PACs and do not have a super PAC. So I'm the one candidate that actually has the liberty to support what the American people are clamoring for. And I think um, the American people deserve to know about all their choices here and the significance of those choices. We're a serious debtor nation, and we have a country that needs new roads, new <coughs> tunnels, new bridges, new airports, new schools, new hospitals. And we don't have the money because it's been squandered on so many of your ideas. What's your and maybe to because your next... you haven't paid any federal income tax for a lot of years. And the other thing I think is important it would be squandered too, is believe me. If, your, if your main claim to be president of the United States is your business, then I think we should talk about that. You know, your campaign manager said that you built a lot of businesses on the backs of little guys. And indeed, I have met a lot of the people who were stiffed by you and your businesses, Donald. I've met dishwashers, painters, architects, glass installers, marble installers, drapery installers, like my dad was. 
who you refused to pay when they finished the work that you asked them to do. We have an architect in the audience who designed one of your clubhouses at one of your golf courses. It's a beautiful facility. It immediately was put to use, and you wouldn't pay what the man needed to be paid, what he was charging you. Maybe he do. didn't do a good job, and I was well, unsatisfied with do, his work, do thousands, which our country do the, should do, do the too. Thousands of people that you have stiffed over the course of your business not deserve some kind of apology from someone who has taken their labor, taken the goods that they produced, and then refused to pay them. I can only say that I'm certainly relieved that my late father never did business with you. Uh, he provided a good middle class life for us, but the people he worked for, he expected the bargain to be kept on both sides. And when we talk about your business, you've taken business bankruptcy six times. There are a lot of great business people that have never taken bankruptcy once. You call yourself the king of debt. You talk about leverage. You even at one time suggested that you would try to negotiate down the Wrong. national debt of the Wrong. United States. Well, sometimes there's not a direct transfer of skills from business to government, but sometimes what happened in business would be really bad for government. That's right, Mr. And Trump. we need so, to yeah, be I think it's, very I do clear think it's about sad. that. Look. It's all words. It's all sound bites. I built an unbelievable <clears throat> company. Some of the greatest assets. I appreciate um, Hillary Clinton's uh, truth telling about Donald Trump. Uh, and I would add to that, aside from screwing his workers uh, and sending his jobs overseas, uh, he also, you know, is, is taken into court uh, for having cheated on the students uh, who were at Trump University, taking uh, large uh, sums of tuition that these poor and working class students did not have uh, readily and essentially not delivering. So he's currently uh, in court. I believe uh, there are hundreds, maybe more than a thousand court cases that Donald Trump has been involved in, which speaks to the kind of uh, integrity uh, that he brings to politics. Uh, Hillary Clinton has a track record as well that's important to be mindful of. Um, Hillary Clinton helped uh, lead the way to dismantling aid to families with dependent children. That also had hurtful consequences. That put over a million children uh, into poverty, children and needy families, by destroying that social safety net. Hillary Clinton led the charge to push down the abysmal poverty wages in Haiti in order that uh, American corporations could be making bigger profits. Uh, Hillary Clinton supported her husband's uh, bill to uh, establish uh, a whole new uh, approach to crime, uh, the so-called Omnibus Crime Bill of the 1990s, which opened the floodgates to mass incarceration and the uh, unconscionable disproportionate incarceration of people of color. So there's a track record here on both parts uh, because both of these candidates uh, you know, are part of the culture of the economic elite. The American people deserve policies and I think representatives uh, who are not taking the money uh, from corporate America. Thank you. African Americans by police, as we've seen recently in Charlotte and Tulsa. Race has been a big issue in this campaign, and one of you is going to have to bridge a very wide and bitter gap. So how do you heal the divide? Secretary Clinton, you get two minutes on this. Well, you're right. Race remains a significant challenge in our country. Unfortunately, race still determines too much often determines where people live, determines what kind of education in their public schools they can get, and yes, it determines how they're treated in the criminal justice system. We've just seen those two tragic examples in both Tulsa and Charlotte. And we've got to do several things at the same time. We have to restore trust between communities and the police we have to work to make sure that our police are using the best training, the best techniques, that they're well prepared to use force only when necessary. Everyone should be respected by the law and 
everyone should respect the law. Right now, that's not the case in a lot of our neighborhoods. So I have, ever since the first day of my campaign, called for criminal justice reform. I've laid out a platform that I think would begin to remedy some of the problems we have in the criminal justice system. But we also have to recognize, in addition to the challenges that we face with policing, there are so many good, brave police officers who equally want reform. So we have to bring communities together in order to begin working on that as a mutual goal. And we've got to get guns out of the hands of people who should not have them. The gun epidemic is the leading cause of death of young African American men, more than the next nine causes put together. So we have to do two things, as I said. We have to restore trust, we have to work with the police, we have to make sure they respect the communities and the communities respect them, and we have to tackle the plague of gun violence, which is a big contributor to a lot of the problems that we're seeing today. All right, Mr. Trump, you have two minutes. How do you heal the divide? Well, first of all, Secretary Clinton doesn't want to use a couple of words, and that's law and order. And we need law and order. If we don't have it, we're not going to have a country. And when I look at what's going on in Charlotte, a city I love, a city where I have investments, when I look at what's going on throughout various parts of our country, whether it's, I mean, I can just keep naming them all day long. We need law and order in our country. And I just got today uh, the, as you know, the endorsement of the Fraternal Order of Police. We just, uh, just came in. Uh, we have endorsements from, I think, almost every police group, very, I mean, a large percentage of them in the United States. Uh, we have a situation where we have uh, our inner cities, African Americans, Hispanics, are living in hell because it's so dangerous. You walk down the street, you get shot. In Chicago, they've had thousands of shootings, thousands, since January 1st. Thousands of shootings. And I'm saying, where is this? Is this a war-torn country? What are we doing? And we have to stop the violence. We have to bring back law and order. In a place like Chicago, where thousands of people have been killed, thousands over the last number of years. In fact, almost 4,000 have been killed since Barack Obama became president. Over four, almost 4,000 people in Chicago have been killed. We have to bring back law and order. Now, whether or not in a place like Chicago you do stop and frisk, which worked very well, Mayor Giuliani is here, worked very well in New York, it brought the crime rate way down. But you take the gun away from criminals that shouldn't be having it. We have gangs roaming the street. And in many cases, they're illegally here, illegal immigrants. And they have guns. And they shoot people. And we have to be very strong. And we have to be very vigilant. We have to, be, we have to know what we're doing. Right now, our police, in many cases, are afraid to do anything. We have to protect our inner cities because African-American communities are being decimated your, by crime. Your two, minutes is, your two minutes expired, but I do want to follow up. Stop and frisk was ruled unconstitutional in New York because it, it largely... So, yeah, I was about to say something about stop and frisk as well. Uh, it was a disaster for human rights. Actually, crime rates were falling in many cities at the same time, so it would be a mistake to attribute uh, decreasing crime rates to stop and frisk, which was a horrific uh, assault on uh, communities of color. Let's also be clear about law and order. The place where we need law and order more than anywhere else is on Wall Street because uh, all the cops have basically been laid off on Wall Street. Wall Street used to have thousands of agents that would enforce law and order on Wall Street. They were basically sent home and it was under those circumstances that Wall Street crashed. But the agents, the FBI agents, the SEC, Securities and Exchange Commission agents, the Department of Justice attorneys are still uh, missing in action. They need to be brought back and we need law and order on Wall Street. Let's also set the record straight. Immigrants are among the most uh, 
nonviolent, law-abiding uh, groups out there. So it is absolutely false for Donald Trump to be fear-mongering against immigrants as a community of violence. Uh, in terms of the racial divides, yes, we have a terrible racial divide, and let's be clear, this didn't just happen. Uh, slavery didn't um, you know, disappear from the face of the earth. When the Emancipation Proclamation uh, was issued, slavery gave way to lynchings, which gave way to Jim Crow, redlining, segregation, um, mass incarceration, uh, the war on drugs, and police violence. So we have a significant problem here. Uh, people are afraid, are mired in fear, and we need to establish a Truth and Reconciliation Commission, uh, much like was done in, in Ferguson there, where they brought art and music and poetry and personal narratives to the table to help us move to a different place, a place of understanding uh, and common ground. And we can do away with the epidemic of police violence by establishing civilian review boards and independent investigators so that we bring accountability to bear here, because there has been none. Communities need to be in charge of their police, not have police in charge of their communities. There's a lot that we should be proud of and we should be supporting and lifting up. But we do always have to make sure we keep people safe. There are the right ways of doing it, and then there are ways that are ineffective. Stop and frisk was found to be unconstitutional, and in part because it was ineffective. It did not do what it needed to do. Now, I believe in community policing. And in fact, violent crime is one half of what it was in 1991. Property crime is down 40%. We just don't want to see it creep back up. We've had 25 years of very good cooperation, but there were some problems, some unintended consequences. Too many young African-American and Latino men ended up in jail for nonviolent offenses, and it's just a fact that if you're a young African-American man and you do the same thing as a young white man, you are more likely to be arrested, charged, convicted, and incarcerated. So we've got to address the systemic racism in our criminal justice system. We cannot just say law and order. We have to say, we, we have to come forward with a plan that is going to so we need to address the systemic racism, not only in policing, uh, but also in the courts, in our prisons, in our economy, for example, where uh, African Americans have now approximately five cents on the dollar of wealth African Americans relative to the, the uh, Caucasian community, five cents on the dollar. Uh, this is just an unconscionable economic racial disparity with real consequences. Educational disparities as well, in which it's the schools, the public schools in communities of color, poor communities of color, that have been subject to uh, school closures, to privatization and to charterization, which has been extremely harmful and hurtful to those communities. Uh, across the board, um, you can look at health, for example, where the average survival of the African American is seven years less, seven years taken off the life of an average, average African American simply for being black, and another seven years taken off the average African American life when that uh, is compounded by poor education. So we need, uh, we're calling, in fact, for a, um, a reparations program to erase the cumulative burden of these disparities, these unconscionable, unconscionable disparities over time, and to actually uh, put us back to being a whole community uh, without these egregious and unconscionable uh, disparities and hardships that have been historically imposed on the African American community. when it comes to policing, since it can have literally fatal consequences, I have said in my first budget, we would put money into that budget to help us deal with implicit bias by retraining a lot of our police officers. I've met with a group of very distinguished, experienced police chiefs a few weeks ago. They admit it's an issue. They've got a lot of concerns. Mental health is one of the biggest concerns because now police are having to handle a lot of really difficult mental health problems on the street. 
they want support. They want more training. They want more assistance. And I think the federal government could be in a position where we would uh, offer and provide that. Mr. I'd like to respond. Please. First of all, uh, I agree, and a lot of people, even within my own party, want to be. Um, absolutely, police need training uh, in de escalation techniques. Right now, the common uh, technique and philosophy of policing uses what's called broken windows, which is an extremely offensive, uh, confrontational form of policing that has disastrous consequences. So we need to change the culture of policing. We need to also change who gets hired in policing so that we're not just taking people straight out of service in the military and leading them to think that they now become an occupying force in our African-American communities. Likewise, we need to stop this militarization of the police. We should not have police loaded up with uh, gear that the military no longer needs. We should not have armored vehicles and tanks and uh, automatic weapons and riot gear as standard police equipment. You don't need a SWAT team in order to deliver a, um, a traffic ticket. Um, and um, you know, we need also to be sure that uh, police forces look like their communities as well, so that uh, there is a common culture between them. It's like supposed to be good, but we went from 2,200 to 500, and it was continued on by Mayor Bloomberg, and it was terminated by current mayor. But stop and fit frisk had a tremendous impact on the safety of New York City, tremendous beyond belief. So when you say it has no impact, it really did. It had a very, very big impact. Well, it's also fair to say, if we're going to talk about uh, mayors, that under the current mayor, crime has continued to drop, including murders. So there no, you're is... Wrong. You're wrong. No, I'm murders not. Murders are up. All right, you check. New York, New York has you're done check. an excellent job. And I give credit. I give credit across the board going back uh, two mayors, two police uh, chiefs, because it has worked, and other communities need to come together to do what will work uh, as well. Look, one murder is too many, but it is important that we learn about... So, in, in, indeed, the uh, murder rate is, in fact, well down compared to the 1990s, though it has had some recent... Uh, increases it is still far below what it used to be um, but it's uh, you know it's very important to look at also the underlying causes here of community violence and in a city like Los Angeles for example half of the city's budget is actually being used right now for uh, policing uh, it's like for the United States half of our budget is being spent on the military right now which deprives other elements of society of the support that they need. So how about we use some of that money for actually uh, creating jobs programs for youth, for addressing high-risk youth, for ensuring that we have social workers in the schools, for ensuring that we have after-school programs, uh, and the kinds of things, and quality schools, so that young people are not sort of abandoned to a desperate and hopeless future and push down the school to prison pipeline. We can prevent this kind of violence. Uh, as Martin Luther King said, violence is not simply the absence of, um, uh, I'm sorry, peace and security are not simply the absence of violence, they are the presence of justice. That's okay. But I will tell you, I've been all over, and I've met some of the greatest people I'll ever meet within these communities, and they are very, very upset with what their politicians have told them and what their politicians have done. I, I, think, I, think that, I think Donald just criticized me for preparing for this debate, and yes, I did. And you know what else I prepared for? I prepared to be president, and I think that's a good thing. Mr. Trump, for five years, you perpetuated a false claim that the nation's first black president was not a natural-born citizen. You questioned his legitimacy. In the last couple of weeks, you acknowledged what most Americans have accepted for years. The president was born in the United States. Can you tell us what took you so I'll, I'll tell you very, well, just very simple to say. Uh, Sidney Blumenthal works for the campaign and close, very close friend of Secretary Clinton. And uh, her... Campaign manager, Patty Doyle. It's really um, 
what can I say, telling that this is a subject of conversation here in the debate. Uh, Donald Trump's obsession with, uh, uh, with this idea, this mythology that Barack Obama was not born in the United States, is this, how much of concern is this really to the American people? The American people need jobs, we need good wages, we need a national living wage standard of at least $15 an hour, we need health care as a human right, we need to end uh, the, uh, the war on drugs and ensure that, uh, that we are not throwing hundreds of thousands of young people into prison for using a substance, marijuana, which is far safer than alcohol and tobacco, which are perfectly legal. We need to empty our jails of the people who have been wrongly incarcerated for the use of a substance uh, which is essentially not harmful relative to uh, other things. So we've got a lot that's important to talk about. Talking about Donald Trump's um, uh, obsession with uh, Barack Obama's place of birth is um, not worthy of our time. I got him to produce uh, the birth certificate, and <laughs> I think I did a good job. Uh, Secretary Clinton also fought it. I mean, you know, now everybody in mainstream is going to say, oh, that's not true. Look, it's true. Sidney Blumenthal sent the reporter. Uh, you just have to take a look at CNN, the last week, the interview with your former campaign manager, and she was involved, but just like she can't bring back jobs, she can't produce, I'm sorry, so let me say a word about, about the climate crisis, because uh, nobody's talking about it, and, uh, and I think that's more important, actually, than uh, Donald Trump's fantasy here. Um, so the science is telling us now, you know, that we are facing month after month now new all-time world records for setting heat records for these months. We've had uh, fires raging across the uh, West Coast. We have established drought in the Southeast. We've just had major floods in southern Louisiana, many other areas of the country. Um, and the science is telling us we can expect as much as nine feet of sea level rise as soon as 2050. This is the most recent study published by uh, James Hansen. So we do have a climate emergency. We need to move on this now. Uh, we need politicians and elected leaders who in fact are accountable and responsible to the American people who are not being paid by the fossil fuel industry to either deny the climate science in, uh, uh, in Donald Trump's case or in Hillary Clinton's case. Uh, to be promoting fracking, which is as deadly, actually, as coal. Coal, which Donald supports, is, uh, is phasing itself out. It's no longer economically viable, but Hillary Clinton is initiating a whole new generation of uh, destructive uh, and uh, unconscionable fossil fuel uh, infrastructure now by promoting fracking, which she did as, uh, as the Secretary of State. She had a whole office to promote fracking around the world. Her, um, uh, her transition director, Ken Salazar, is himself a big booster for fracking. So I'd say for those who care about the climate, it's really important now for us to step up to the plate uh, and for us to do like the indigenous people at Standing Rock Sioux Nation uh, Reservation who stood up for what is essential, we need to actually stand up now, not buy into this lesser evil uh, mythology and insist on the uh, substantive policies we need now in order to ensure that, um, that we have a climate and a planet to be here for our kids. Thank you. And used against him. But I like to remember what Michelle Obama said in her amazing speech at our Democratic National Convention. When they go low, we go high. And Barack Obama went high, despite Donald Trump's best efforts to bring him down. Mr. Trump, you can respond, then we're going to move on. I would love to respond. First of all, I got to watch in preparing for this some of your debates against Barack Obama. You treated him okay. with terrible disrespect. And I watch the way you talk now about how lovely everything is and how wonderful you are. It doesn't work that way. You were after him. You were trying to. You even sent out, or your campaign sent out, pictures of him in a certain garb, very famous pictures. I don't think you can deny that. 
But just last week, <laughs> the campaign manager said it was true. So when you try to act holier than thou, it really doesn't work. It really doesn't. Now, as far as the lawsuit, yes, when I was very young, I went into my father's company, had a real estate company in Brooklyn and Queens, and we, along with many, many other companies throughout the country, it was a federal lawsuit, were sued. We settled the suit with zero, with no admission of guilt. Oh, sure. It was very yeah. easy to do, but they sued many people. I notice you bring that up a lot, and uh, you know, I also noticed on the issue of race, I think it's very important to acknowledge the transformative role of the Black Lives Matter movement, of people, uh, particularly young people in our communities, who are standing up for the justice that they deserve, who are standing up peacefully, who are standing up to say, not one more death, not one more uh, unjustified and violent death at the hands of police. We see case after case and videotape after videotape of these absolutely heart-wrenching stories. Uh, it is time, I think, to acknowledge the very powerful role the Black Lives Matter campaign is playing here. Unlike the Democratic Party, which put out a secret memo to just like give them a nod and a pat on the back, but be sure you don't actually uh, make concessions or take their suggestions. In fact, they are leading the way forward as young African Americans led the way forward during the Civil Rights Movement. They're making an inordinate contribution now to the future that we can have together as a peaceful, just society that gets past this crisis of racist violence. So my question is, who's behind it and how do we fight it? Secretary Clinton, this answer goes to you. Well, I think cyber security, cyber warfare will be one of the biggest challenges facing the next president because clearly we're facing at this point uh, two different kinds of adversaries. There are the independent hacking groups that do it mostly for uh, commercial reasons to try to steal information that they then can use to make money. But increasingly, we are seeing cyber attacks coming from states, organs of states. The most recent and troubling of these has been Russia. There's no doubt now that Russia has used cyber attacks against all kinds of organizations in our country, and I am deeply concerned about this. I know Donald's uh, very praise, praiseworthy of uh, Vladimir Putin, but Putin is playing a really tough, long game here. And one of the things he's done is to let loose uh, cyber attackers, to hack into government uh, files, to hack into personal files, hack into the Democratic National Committee. And we recently uh, have learned that, you know, that this is one of their uh, preferred methods of trying to wreak havoc and collect information. We need to make it very clear, whether it's Russia, China, Iran, or anybody else, the United States has much greater capacity. And we are not going to sit idly by and permit state actors to go after our information, our private sector information or our public sector information. And we're going to have to make it clear that we don't want to use the kinds of tools that we have. We don't want to engage in a different kind of warfare, but we will defend the citizens of this country. And the Russians need to understand that. I think they've been treating it as almost a, a probing. Uh, how far would we go? How much would we do? And that's why I was, so, I was so shocked when Donald publicly invited Putin to hack into Americans. That is, that is just unacceptable. It's one of the reasons why 50 national security officials who served in Republican information in, in administration have said that Donald is unfit to be the commander in chief. It's comments like that that really worry people who understand the threats that we face. Mr. Trump, you have two minutes in the same question. You Who's know, behind I, it? I, I do want to say that I was just endorsed and more are coming next week. It'll be over 200 admirals, many of them are here, admirals and generals endorsed me to lead this country. Uh, that just happened and many more are coming. And I'm very proud of it. Uh, in addition, I was just endorsed by ICE. They've never endorsed anybody before on immigration. Uh, I was just endorsed by ICE. I was just recently endorsed 16,500 Border Patrol agents. So when uh, Secretary Clinton talks about this, I mean, I'll take the admirals 
and I'll take the generals any day over the political hacks that I see that have led our country so brilliantly over the last 10 years with their knowledge, okay? Because look at the mess that we're in. Look at the mess that we're in. As far as the cyber, I agree to parts of what Secretary Clinton said. Uh, we should be better than anybody else, and perhaps we're not. I don't think anybody knows it was Russia that broke into the DNC. She's saying Russia, 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 but I don't, maybe it was. I mean, it could be Russia, but it could also be China. It could also be lots of other people. It also could be somebody sitting on their bed that weighs 400 pounds, okay? You don't know who broke in to DNC, but what did we learn with DNC? We learned that Bernie Sanders was taken advantage of by your people by Debbie Wasserman Schultz. Look what happened to her. But Bernie Sanders was taken advantage of. That's what we lose. Now, whether that was Russia, whether that was China, whether it was another country, we don't know. Because the truth is, under President Obama, we've lost control of things that we used to have control over. We came in with the internet, we came up with the internet, and I think Secretary Clinton and myself would agree very much when you look at what ISIS is doing with the internet, they're beating us at our own game, ISIS. So we have to get very, very tough on cyber and cyber warfare. Uh, it, is a, it is a huge problem. I have a son, he's 10 years old. He has computers. He is so good with these computers, it's unbelievable. The security aspect of cyber is very, very tough. And maybe it's, it's hardly doable. But I will say, we are not doing the job we should be doing. But that's true throughout our whole governmental society. We have so many things that we have to do better, Lester, and certainly cyber is one of them. Secretary Clinton. Well, I think there are a number of issues that uh, we should be addressing. So we need an international treaty to prevent cyber warfare. And the Chinese, and I believe the Russians as well, have been trying to get such a treaty going, and our government has been refusing to go along. But I think, you know, we need to listen to the concerns here that have been rightly raised. It's time for such a treaty, and it's time for us to stop thwarting it. Uh, we need to move ahead with that. Uh, I actually agree with Donald Trump here. Uh, strangely enough, that there in fact is no evidence that the Russians were the ones who hacked into the DNC emails. On the other hand, those, those emails gave plenty of evidence that the DNC was engaged in, uh, uh, in uh, unfair backroom backstabbing and was really smearing Bernie Sanders uh, through their treatment, their placement of anonymous articles, and so on. So if somebody is um, messing with the U.S. elections, it was clearly the DNC. There is no evidence uh, that it was the Russians here. One of the um, heads of national security, in fact, said as much that there was a whole lot of hyperventilation here, but not a lot of substance. And let me say, on the issue of Edward Snowden, he should certainly be given a pardon. He should be brought home with a hero's welcome. Uh, in the words of Benjamin Franklin, those who would compromise privacy uh, in the name of security will wind up losing them both. We can both protect national security at the same time that we protect privacy. And we owe a debt of thanks also to Julian Assange and WikiLeaks for exposing the leaks uh, of so many whistleblowers who showed how the U.S. government was engaged in war crimes, in illicit activity, uh, and was doing things in our name that were not uh, legal and we're not ethical and we're not moral. So um, we are the better for those exposures and both of them should be uh, pardoned and welcomed home. Julian Assange obviously not coming here, but he should certainly be uh, released from his uh, imprisonment uh, in the Ecuadorian uh, embassy and no longer under threat of extradition to the U.S. and persecution, or rather prosecution and persecution, uh, for um, underneath the Espionage Act. Either because the oil was their primary source of income, and now they have the oil all over the place, including the oil, a lot of the oil in Libya, which was another one of her disasters. Secretary Clinton. 
Well, I hope the fact checkers are turned up and turning up the volume and really working hard. Donald supported the invasion of Iraq. Wrong. That is absolutely Wrong. proved over and over again. Wrong. We actually advocated for the actions we took in Libya and urged that uh, Gaddafi be taken out after actually doing some business with him one time. But the larger point, he says this constantly, is George W. Bush made the agreement about when American troops would leave Iraq, not Barack Obama. And the only way that American troops could have stayed in Iraq is to get an agreement from the then Iraqi government that would have protected our troops. And the Iraqi government would not give that. But let's talk about the question you asked, Lester. The question you asked is, what do we do here in the United States? That's the most important part of this. How do we prevent attacks? How do we protect our people? And I think we've got to have an intelligence surge where we are looking for every scrap of information. I was so proud of law enforcement in New York, in uh, So let's be clear that we will not have peace and security at home unless we also have peace and security abroad. This hyper beefed up militarism that Hillary Clinton has been practicing. She did lead the charge into the catastrophe of Libya. She did strongly support the war in Iraq and from uh, all evidence uh, so did Donald Trump and he's certainly beating the war drums right now. Let's look at the track record of this uh, military approach to foreign policy. It has created uh, well, first of all, it has cost us $6 trillion, according to a 2013 uh, Harvard study. $6 trillion for Iraq and Afghanistan alone, when you include the cost of caring for our wounded soldiers, and that's the least that we can do. They deserve better care, in fact. But $6 trillion for those two wars, uh, and add to that a million people killed in Iraq, tens of thousands of our soldiers killed and maimed. What do we have to show for it? mass refugee migrations, failed states, and worse terrorist threats. We need a new approach on our foreign policy based on international law, human rights, and diplomacy. The American people have had enough of these wars without, in fact, even being told of their cost, which amounts to half of our discretionary budget and practically half of your income taxes are going to pay for these wars on terror, which only create yet another cycle of terror. There is no military solution to that kind of crisis. We need to uh, create a new offensive in the Middle East, a peace offensive, that starts with a weapons embargo and a freeze on the bank accounts of those countries that continue to fund terrorist jihadi enterprises. That is how we get to peace and security overseas and peace and security here because those wars and the uh, anguish surrounding them are blowing back here. That's what that terrorist threat is about. We can deal with them both by creating a foreign policy based on international law, human rights, and diplomacy. And contract. And number two, I said it very strongly, NATO could be obsolete because, and I was very strong on this, and it was actually covered very accurately in the New York Times, which is unusual for the New York Times, to be honest. But I said they do not focus on terror. And I was very strong, and I said it numerous times. And about four months ago, I read on the front page of the Wall Street Journal that NATO is opening up a major terror division. And I think that's great. And I think we should get, because we pay approximately 73% of the cost of NATO, it's a lot of money to protect other people. But I'm all for NATO. But I said they have to focus on terror also. And they're gonna do that. And that was, believe me, I'm sure I'm not gonna get credit for it, but that was largely because of what I was saying and my criticism of NATO. I think we have to get NATO to go into the Middle East with us in addition to surrounding nations, and we have to knock the hell out of ISIS, and we have to do it fast. When ISIS formed... So knocking the hell out of ISIS, 
will uh, be very successful in creating the next generation of terrorism in the same way that knocking the hell out of Al-Qaeda is what created ISIS out of the chaos of Iraq and Afghanistan. And likewise, Al-Qaeda itself was created by the policy that was not so brilliant in retrospect of creating this international jihadi movement together with uh, the Saudis and the CIA in order to beef up the Mujahideen, a terrorist movement in order to thwart the Soviet Union in Afghanistan. So this history uh, is coming back to bite us in a very big way. We need a different way forward. Bombing the hell out of terror only creates the next generation of terror. In terms of vacuuming up uh, all the security information we can, what you can be sure is that we will then have an even larger haystack uh, in which the needle cannot be found. Uh, we need to protect the rights and the privacy of uh, everyday people and only go after information where it is warranted. And certainly where it is warranted, we need to use all the techniques uh, of uh, security and surveillance, but not without a warrant and specific cause. Thank you. I had numerous conversations with Sean Hannity at Fox, and Sean Hannity said, and he called me the other day, and I spoke to him about it. He said you were totally against war because he was for the war. Why is and he me, better? Than and that was before the war started. Sean Hannity said very strongly. To me and other people, he's willing to say it, but nobody wants to call him. I was against the war. He said, you used to have fights with me because Sean was in favor of the war. And I understand that side also, not very much, because we should have never been there. But nobody calls Sean Hannity. And then they did an article in a major magazine shortly after the war started, I think in 04, but they did an article which had me totally against the war in Iraq. And one of your compatriots said, you know, whether it was before or right after, Trump was definitely, because if you read this article, there's no doubt. But if somebody, and I'll ask the press, if somebody would call up Sean Hannity, this So, you know, how much time are we going to spend debating what Donald Trump did and didn't say? Uh, who knows? Who cares? Um, what Donald Trump says is not necessarily what Donald Trump does, so I'm not sure that we want to spend too much time on that. Uh, in terms of blaming Hillary for the mess in the Middle East, there's no doubt that uh, Hillary played a major role, uh, certainly in the chaos in Libya and in supporting the war in Iraq. Um, going forward, you know, it's, it's really important that we have a different policy in the Middle East. And again, we call for a peace offensive, not only to uh, end the flow of weapons. We are the major supplier of weapons which get into the hands of combatants on all sides of the issue, not only in the Middle East, but all around the world. So we have enormous potential to start that weapons embargo and to urge the Russians to also come on board. Russia, in fact, is also paying dearly for, this, um, for the terrorism uh, crisis. They cannot afford their military any more than we can afford our military. We need to start working together uh, in a principled collaboration. It's great that we're working together right now, but we're working together for the wrong thing. We're working together to drop more bombs on ISIS, which is not going to be the solution. We need together to bring in all our other allies to actually create a weapons embargo to the region, particularly to Syria, to stop the flow of troops across Turkey's border. Uh, and to uh, stop the flow of funding by putting a freeze on the bank accounts. Hillary Clinton herself identified the Saudis as still the major funder of Sunni Jihad enterprises in a leaked State Department email uh, when she was Secretary of State. So we got this mess started. We know how to shut it down. The only one benefiting from this insane foreign policy is the weapons industry. It's time to get them out of the business of defining American foreign policy. Sanctions on Iran. And we did drive them to the negotiating table. And my successor, John Kerry, and President Obama got a deal that put a lid on Iran's nuclear program without firing a single shot. 
That's diplomacy. That's coalition building. That's working with other nations. The other day, I saw Donald saying that there were some Iranian sailors on a ship in the waters off of Iran, and they were taunting American sailors who were on a nearby ship. He said, you know, if they taunted our sailors, I'd blow them out of the water and start another war. That's that would not good sort of judgment. That is not the right temperament to be commander in chief, to be taunted. And the worst part no, of they what you've heard us. Donald say has been about nuclear weapons. He has said repeatedly that he didn't care if other nations got nuclear weapons, Japan, South Korea, even Saudi Arabia. It has been the policy of the United States, Democrats and Republicans, to do everything we could to reduce the proliferation of nuclear weapons. He even said, well, you know, if there were a nuclear war in the East Asia, well, you know, that's fine. You know, well, have a good time, folks. And in fact, his cavalier attitude about nuclear weapons is so deeply troubling. That is the number one threat we face in the world, and it becomes particularly threatening if terrorists ever get their hands on any nuclear material. So a man who can be provoked by a tweet should not have his fingers anywhere near the nuclear <coughs> codes, as far as I think anyone would... So um, when it comes to nuclear weapons, the Obama administration has committed us to a trillion dollars on a new generation of nuclear weapons and their modes of delivery. I haven't heard Hillary Clinton uh, give any indication that she uh, would change that course. So we are basically plunging headlong into a new nuclear arms race. And in that context, yes, it would be terrifying for Donald Trump's finger to be on the button, but I will also be terrified if Hillary Clinton's finger is on the button. She, in fact, is uh, pushing for an air war with Russia over Syria. Her stated uh, policy for dealing with Syria is to create a no-fly zone, which means basically that we are at war with other powers that are in that airspace, namely Russia. We now have 2,000 nuclear missiles on hair trigger alert, and Hillary Clinton is uh, fanning the flames of conflict between the U.S. and the Soviet and uh, Russia, both with the uh, movement of, nu of uh, NATO troops. Uh, surrounding Russia on its border, the proliferation of anti-ballistic missiles around its border. Uh, this is not the direction we need to go. We need to be moving towards nuclear disarmament, which is a concept that seems to be completely foreign to both Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. That is the one solution here to the uh, nuclear threats that we are facing. It's not stopping proliferation. It's actually stopping the use of nuclear weapons and their existence for once and for all by moving to um, nuclear abolition. In, not just in our lifetimes, but as, a, as an international emergency to do this as quickly as possible. The other night I was seeing B-52s there, old enough that your, your father, your grandfather could be flying them. Uh, we, are not, we are not keeping up with other countries. I would like everybody to end it, just get rid of it, uh, but I would certainly not do first strike. I think that once the nuclear alternative happens, it's over. At the same time, we have to be prepared. I can't take anything off the table because you look at some of these countries, you look at North Korea, uh, we're doing nothing there. China should solve that problem for us. China should go into North Korea. China is, is totally powerful as it relates to North Korea. And by the way, another one powerful is the worst deal I think I've ever seen negotiated that you started is the Iran deal. Iran is one of their biggest trading partners. Iran has power over North Korea. And when they made that horrible deal with Iran, they should have included the fact that they do something with respect to North Korea. And they should have done something with respect to Yemen and all these other places. And when I asked to Secretary Kerry, why didn't you do that? Why didn't you do add other things into the deal? One of the great giveaways of all time, of all time, including $400 million in cash Nobody's ever seen that before. That turned out to be wrong. It was actually $1.7 billion in cash. Obviously, I guess, for the hostages, it certainly looks that way. 
So you say to yourself, why didn't they make the right deal? This is one of the worst deals ever made by any country in history. The deal with Iran will lead to nuclear problems. All they have to do is sit back 10 years, and they don't have to do much, and they're going to end up getting nuclear. I met with Bibi Netanyahu the other day. Believe me, he is not a happy camper. All right. Mrs. Uh, well, Clinton, Secretary Clinton, you have two minutes. Let me, let, me, let me start by saying words matter. Words matter when you run for president, and they really matter when you are president. And I want to reassure our allies in Japan and South Korea and elsewhere that we have mutual defense treaties and we will honor them. It is essential that America's word be good. And so I know that this campaign has caused some questioning and some worries on the part of many leaders across the globe. I've talked with a number of them. Uh, but I want to, on behalf of myself, and I think on behalf of a majority of the American people, say that you know our word is good. It's also important that we look at the entire global situation. There's no doubt that we have other problems with Iran, but personally I'd rather deal with the other problems having put that lid on their nuclear program than still to be facing that. And Donald never tells you what he would do. Would he have started a war? Would he have bombed Iran? If he's going to criticize a deal that has been very successful in giving us access to Iranian facilities that we never had before, then he should tell us what his alternative would be. But it's like his plan to defeat ISIS. He says it's a secret plan, but the only secret is that he has no plan. So we need to be more precise in how we talk about these issues. People around the world follow our presidential campaigns so closely, trying to get hints about what we will do. Can they rely on us? Are we going to lead the world with strength and in accordance with our values? That's what I intend to do. I intend to be a leader of our country that people can count on both here at home and around the world. Uh, to make decisions that will further peace and prosperity, but also stand up to bullies, whether they're abroad or at home. We cannot let those who would try to destabilize the world to interfere with American interests and security to be given any opportunities at all. Let's do one thing I'd like to say. Very quickly. Uh, I will go very quickly. But I will so in terms of the Iran deal, um, you know, this is certainly a good thing to uh, ensure that there will not be a nuclear weapon in the future uh, for Iran. But let's remember, uh, while that Iran deal looked at a future possibility, uh, Iran does not currently have a nuclear weapons program and according to U.S. security agencies was not engaged in creating a nuclear weapon uh, program. Uh, on the other hand, there are nuclear weapons right now in the hands, for example, of Israel and of, of Pakistan, which certainly has its issues of instability. So there is good reason for us to have actually broadened that nuclear uh, uh, agreement with Iran to have created a nuclear-free Middle East as a first step towards achieving a nuclear-free world and for the U.S. to be leading the way. Uh, rather than beating the war drum and looking for opportunities to beef up our weapons uh, budget, which as I mentioned, the military now takes half of our discretionary budget. It now takes half of your income tax dollars, 44% to be specific, uh, into this bloated and dangerous military where we have troops in, in approximately 800 or 1,000 bases in over uh, something like a hundred countries around the world. Uh, this is bankrupting us. It is not making the world a safer place. It is creating a lot of trigger situations in which we get involved 
uh, in conflicts and we create conflicts and exacerbate them. So we need a way forward in which we are not trying to uh, create opportunities for a bigger military budget in which the weapons industry uh, is basically looking for excuses uh, to provide itself with more uh, uh, funded projects. Uh, it's very important. Uh, I'm the only candidate in this race that is not taking money from the weapons industry, nor taking money from the fossil fuel industry, which is the purpose of many of these conflicts overseas in order to defend the sources of our fossil fuels and their routes of transportation. So I think it's very important that the American people have a truly honest broker uh, in the White House who's standing up for what everyday people need, not uh, policies that are getting us into very serious trouble around the world, not making us safer, making us bankrupt, uh, and uh, just creating a very explosive and dangerous future for us all. He tried to switch from, from looks to stamina. But this is a man who has called women pigs, slobs, and dogs. And someone who has said pregnancy is an inconvenience to employers, who has said women don't deserve equal pay unless they do as good a job as men. And one of the worst things he said was about a woman in a beauty contest. He loves beauty contests, supporting them and hanging around them. And he called this woman Miss Piggy. To then conclude. he called her Miss Housekeeping. Because she so um, again, um, a lot of name calling. Uh, a lot of, uh, you know, just throwing each other uh, into the mud here, the mud wrestling. Uh, the American people deserve better. Uh, we deserve a president who is not funded by the weapons industry, the fossil fuel giants, the war profiteers, but who is accountable to you, the American people, and is delivering the future that actually is within our reach when we stand up and demand it. There are 42 million young people who are locked into predatory student loan debt. That alone right there is enough votes to actually win this election. I'm the only candidate who will cancel student debt like we did for uh, Wall Street and bailing out Wall Street. It's time to bail out the students. And with the power of that bailout, we actually have the ability to bring out enough people who could actually take over this election and win it for the future that we deserve to uh, end student debt, make public higher education free, and create a Green New Deal uh, that will provide an emergency jobs program as well as tackling the crisis of climate change. Thank you. election. So my final question to you tonight, are you willing to accept the outcome as the will of the voters? Secretary Clinton? Well, I support our democracy. And uh, sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. Uh, but I uh, certainly uh, will support the outcome of this election. Uh, and I know Donald's trying very hard to plant doubts about it, but I hope the people out there understand this election's really up to you. It's not about us so much as it is about you and your families and the kind of country and future you want. So I sure hope you will get out and vote as though your future depended on it, because I think it does. Mr. Trump, very quickly, the same question. Will you accept the outcome as the will of the voters? I want to make America great again. We are a nation that is seriously troubled. We're losing our jobs. People are pouring in to our country. The other day, we were deporting 800 people. And perhaps they passed the wrong button, they pressed the wrong button, or perhaps, worse than that, it was corruption. But these people that we were going to deport, for good reason, ended up becoming citizens. Ended up becoming citizens. And it was 800, and now it turns out it might be 1,800, and they don't even know. Well, you so look, here's America the story. Election. I want to make America great again. I'm going to be able to do it. I don't believe Hillary will. The answer is, if she wins, I will absolutely support her. All right. Well, that is going to do it for us. That concludes our debate for this evening. A spirited one. We covered a lot of ground. Not everything. And okay. I suspected we wouldn't. Great.
So I just want to thank all of you for tuning in to the real debate. Uh, Americans not only have a right to vote, we have a right to know who we can vote for and what we are voting about in this election, particularly in this election where the establishment candidates have effectively been rejected by the majority of voters who say these are the most disliked and untrusted uh, uh, candidates for president in our history. Um, and in fact, even the majority of their own voters aren't supporting them but are just really against the other candidate. At the same time, we have a huge majority of the voters that are saying they want to know who the other candidates are. I encourage you to go to my website, jill2016.com, uh, and join our campaign for open debates. Just today, I heard the uh, new polling result that something like 54% of millennials are considering uh, voting for a third party candidate and denying their vote to the establishment candidates that are being uh, essentially shoved down our throats. Uh, so it's time for us to stand up. In this election, we're not just deciding what kind of a world we will be, but whether we will have a world or not going forward, considering that we have a climate crisis which is barreling down on us, uh, which is only accelerating under Democrats as under Republicans, considering that we have wars that are expanding. They are not uh, contracting and there is no end in sight and they are bankrupting us. We have an entire generation of young people who are locked in debt and we have African Americans whose lives are on the firing line now um, with this crisis of racial justice and police violence. So we have very serious crises, some of which uh, it's now or never. This is the Hail Mary moment. We need to stand up. Uh, and take back our future, knowing that we actually have the votes just from the young people who are in debt alone. We actually have the votes that we could turn this around in real time. So I urge you to reject the, the, uh, the propaganda, don't drink the Kool-Aid, reject the lesser evil, and fight for the greater good like our lives depend on it because in fact they do. We do have the power to create an America and a world that works for all of us. The power to create that world is not just in our hopes, it's not just in our dreams, it's right here and now, it's in our hands. Together we are unstoppable. Thank you for making it so. Yep. Yeah, Stein, so Jill is going to take a short, well-deserved break. Don't go away because she's going to come back. I'm going to take the floor for just five short minutes. A poor substitute indeed, but Jill will be back in five short minutes. So I'm going to ask uh, if I could get a microphone. Jill, take a drink of water. I will do that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, David. All right, can we get a round of applause again for our president of Canada, Jill Stein? You know, I have rarely, rarely been so nervous in following Dr. Jill Stein. But it is with courage that I take this podium because I have the great privilege to tell you what you can do right now because I know you're fired up. How can you not be hearing a presidential candidate actually tell the truth, actually talk about racism and sexism and class oppression, actually talk about the idea of transforming the social, political, and economic institutions of this country. So here's my challenge. We know many of you, it looks like over a million of you were participating in Facebook Live and Twitter and Periscope. So you know what I got for you? How about that one? Hey, Jill! We want to hear from you. We want you to talk directly to Dr. Jill Stein and share your thoughts What's working? What could we do better? How can we actually build a movement to take and exercise state power? I'm going to say that again. To take and exercise state power. Because the Green Party is not merely a protest party. We are a movement party. As surely as the abolitionist or the women's suffrage movement or the trade union movement or the civil rights movement or the LGBT movement, every movement that takes itself seriously understands the need to build a broad, deep, conscious, militant social movement and an electoral arm of that movement. 
I want you to think about it for a moment, and I want to appeal directly to Black Lives Matter, Occupy Wall Street, the Move to Men campaign to abolish corporate constitutional rights, the movements to end the racist prison industrial complex, the movements to address the climate crisis, the movements that are already engaging tens of millions of people, to ask you honestly, do you hear any other candidates besides Jill Stein and Ajamu Baraka actually giving plans that will address the concerns that are motivating you to be social change agents? Because I don't think you're social change agents. I don't think you're merely activists. I don't think you're merely reacting. I think you're social change agents. I think you're actually committed to winning. And the Stein Baraka campaign is connected to winning again. And that brings me to the next thing. Go to that website jill2016.com slash volunteer. I know you're fired up. Don't act like you ain't. How could you not be? So we want to, your energy. We want your sweat equity. We want your ideas. We want your brilliance. We want your love. We want you to work with us, right? We want to collaborate with you. You'll see a different kind of campaign. And I'm going to say it, y'all. You're going to see a campaign that is intersectional. You're going to see a campaign that takes head on patriarchy and white supremacy. You'll see a campaign that does not shy away from the reality of this society and says, we are going to actually build a culture where we call each other in to our greater good. Call each other in to the recognition that we're sisters and brothers in this fight and this struggle. And that different people, because of the history of how they occupy this world in what kind of body they're in, have had different lived experiences, but nobody's expendable. Every single one of them are actually important. Again, I want to remind you the hashtag Hashtag, hey Jill, we want to hear from you. That's hashtag, hey Jill. And I got to tell you, my fundraiser would be mad at me if I didn't say this. Jill2016.com, donate. Come on, y'all. We are talking about raising millions of dollars for peaceful, nonviolent revolution. Surely you got 50 bucks that you can throw in. If you ain't got 50, make it 25. If you ain't got 25, make it 10, right? Everybody can give what they can. You know, as a fundraiser, as somebody, I, see, I, I like raising money for social change. And I'm not scared of it because you know what I know? That what we do with money is the goddess's own work. We're actually dedicated to making that level of change and we can do it and we do do it. So I will never tell anybody, give till it hurts. I hate that phrase, don't you? Give till it hurts. Don't give till it hurts. I don't want you to hurt. I don't want anybody to hurt. But I'll also say this. I don't want to tell you, give till you feel good because I hope you already feel Feel good. I hope you already feel good uh, about the work that you're doing. I hope you're inspired to feel good. I hope it doesn't take money to make you either feel good or feel bad. So I'm going to actually make this challenge to you. I'm going to look you right in the eye and tell you this. Give till it feels right. And I don't know how much that is. For some of you, you could easily give $2,700. That's the maximum amount that any individual can give. So if you can afford to do that, if you're inspired to do that, give that much. If you can give $1,000, give that. If you can give $500, give that. If you can give $100, give that. If you can give $50, give that. You see what I'm saying? Give till it feels right to you. And I don't know what that right amount is, but you need to do it. And because all the young people have told me the importance of hashtags, Hashtag Hey Jill, right? Hashtag Hey Jill, let's make that trend. Because what Jill wants to hear from you, Dr. Stein actually wants to hear from you. That hashtag will give you an opportunity to talk directly to her. And believe me, she actually reads that. And she actually it will, will incorporate those things in her, her talking points. So as I uh, prepare to give the floor back to Dr. Jill Stein to continue this, we want to make sure that you continue to participate. JillStein.com, you got to sign up. You know, this movement is getting larger, stronger, and better organized every day. And I want you to think about a moment about what you just experienced. What you saw was a people's platform and a people's campaign that actually challenged the corporate control of the narrative and using technology, the open internet, using your sweat equity and interest to insert ourselves into a debate to shift the power in this country. And as Dr. Jill Stein says, it's in our hands. And with that, 
I want to welcome back to the stage, Dr. Dr. Jill Stein. <laughs> Thank you. So, I guess um, I'm going to hear your questions. And again, as David said, send me your questions at hashtag Hey Jill, and I just have to give a big thank you to David Cobb and a thank you to all of our staff for our campaign and to Ajamu Baraka who is here tonight with me and to his staff as well. So I just want to give a big thank you, if I could, another round of applause for all the great work you guys are doing. And send me your questions, I will give a lightning round uh, reply to them because I understand Twitter gives me exactly 30 seconds and no more. So these are going to be really quick replies. Okay, uh, so uh, um, our first question uh, is uh, actually a quote and uh, we'd like you to talk about that quote. Um, that one is from Martin Luther King when, when he says, when there is injustice anywhere, it is a threat to justice everywhere. What does that mean to you? That means that we must work together uh, to fight for racial justice and social justice and climate justice uh, and for peace and women's justice. Uh, at the end of the day, all justice runs together, but together we are absolutely unstoppable. Um, another question is from Kyra L. Moore, who says, it would, would it cost less to write off all student loan debt than the Wall Street bailout cost? Great question. Yes, it costs far less. So we came up with $16 trillion to bail out Wall Street. What we need to bail out uh, student loan debtors is $1.3 trillion dollars. We can certainly come up with that money. There is no more important investment for our future and for our society than our younger generation. This one is from Shelby who says, hey Jill, what are your opinions and stances on NAFTA and the TPP? Um, on NAFTA, it was a disaster that sent our jobs overseas and depressed wages here at home. The TPP is even worse. Uh, it is NAFTA on steroids. Not only, you know, same thing for our jobs and our wages, but it also creates this uh, investor state dispute system uh, that puts our laws and our regulations at the mercy of international corporations. So it is a disaster. We must stop it. Um, we also have a, a question called, um, hey Jill, technology is estimated to eliminate 30% of jobs by the end of the next decade. Is the solution a basic universal income? Uh, yes, absolutely. A universal basic income is one way uh, to approach this. Another is uh, through a Green New Deal, which also uh, creates the right to a job, a good job that helps us meet this emergency of climate change. Right now, we're in an all hands on deck situation. So we need, we need everybody right now. That uh, making uh, workers obsolete is not uh, in sight if you actually consider the climate change and the transformation we need to accomplish uh, starting right now. Okay, all right, so I'm just getting a note here to remind you to please share your live stream on Facebook and on Twitter so that we can get the word out and build this bigger movement for uh, justice and for the transformation that we urgently need and that we deserve. Um, okay, great. Um, this one is from uh, Will O'Regan, who said, uh, this was obviously a huge success tonight in the debate. Were you, you worried you would be under arrest when you went to Hofstra? Would you do this again? Um, 
Absolutely, I would do this again, but I hope the next time that we are actually on the debate stage. So don't let them tell you that resistance is futile or that our struggle for democracy and justice is over. It's only just begun. We deserve to be on that debate stage and to have a debate that's heard by all of the American people. And uh, I encourage you to share your live stream on Facebook and Twitter and let's get the word out to as many people as possible. Our next question is from Manny Ortiz, who says, Hey Jill, if you become our POTUS, what kind of policies would you implement to help reverse climate change? Thank you, uh, Manny. So number one is we need to put an immediate ban on all new fossil fuel infrastructure. We cannot afford a single more pipeline. Uh, we are facing a disaster situation right now with the fossil fuels that we have. Number two is that we need to phase them out, all fossil fuels, by the year 2030 in time to actually stop the climate catastrophe that's uh, barreling down on us right now. Thank you. Um. <clears throat> So uh, the next question uh, will be from uh, S. Uh, Susie Kais, who says, Hey Jill, how do you plan to help our public schools and special education programs? Great. Uh, two very important questions. We need to fully fund our public schools, including our special education programs. We need small classroom size. We need far more teachers. We need to end high stakes testing, which is being used as an excuse to close down poor schools. It's essentially an indicator of poverty. Uh, we need to address poverty in and of itself. Uh, but in this classroom, we need to teach to the whole student for lifetime learning and to bring back music creation and art. Our next question is from Monet Lemon, who says, Hey Jill, what is your plan to work with the Black Lives Matter movement to end police brutality? Uh, thank you, uh, Moniz. The Black Lives Matter movement is leading the charge, and they're coming up with very important uh, policy solutions uh, that I talked about during the debate, and that includes um, civilian review boards with the power to hire and fire and also the power of subpoena, as well as independent investigators, changing the culture of policing and ending the militarization and providing funds for the engagement of young people. Um, our next uh, question is from Marcy Angelis, who says, could you please elaborate on your support of indigenous rights for undecided native voters? Thank you. Yes, so I was recently uh, standing with the uh, Standing Rock Sioux in North Dakota um, because their work is critical and really leads the way with enormous courage and vision. We support treaty rights. Um, my campaign supports treaty rights, uh, which are essential, and those treaty rights have been uh, ignored and discarded. We also support reparations for the uh, lands that have been taken from indigenous people. Okay. Great. Um, our next question is from A.T. Spears, who says, Hey, Jill, can you talk to us about the deregulation of corporate America and how you view true democracy in the United States? Great. So the deregulation of corporate America is what brought us the Wall Street meltdown. Uh, deregulation of corporate America brought us the consolidation of insurance companies so that prices go up and quality goes down. It also led to the consolidation of uh, of media companies as well. We need to bring back antitrust laws so that we can break up these consolidated corporations that again uh, are uh, are ripping us off, are charging us higher prices, and have lost their uh, creativity um, as a rule as they become bigger. Our next question is uh, from uh, uh, Kyra L. Moore, who says, Hey Jill, does it make sense that we sold $150 billion of weapons to the Saudis this year? Um, I think that figure's a little high. Um, uh, I'm not sure. We did sell them billions of dollars this year, and we've sold them over a hundred billion dollars uh, over the last uh, ten years, which uh, is uh, would not happen under a Stein and Baraka administration. The Saudis are violating uh, human rights, committing war crimes. Uh, they should not be sold. Uh, weapons on that basis, and those criteria should be applied across the board. Great. 
Um, our next question is from uh, Felicia Hogan, who says, hey, Jill, what is your opinion on LGBT rights? LGBT rights need to be supported. I was actually the first uh, governor candidate in Massachusetts to support equal marriage at a time when the Democrats were trying to figure out whether they supported civil unions. So we believe that uh, discrimination is um, uh, is unconscionable and should not be allowed, whether on the basis of sexual preference or gender identity or uh, race or religion for that matter. Human rights are human rights and need to be supported and enforced in the workplace. Um, our next question is uh, from, uh, well, uh, a person named Jill Not Hill, <laughs> who says, hey Jill, would you close Gitmo on day one? Uh, uh, I would certainly work to do that, and I would um, fight vigorously uh, to have all of the remaining prisoners moved uh, out of Gitmo and to shut down this facility, which is a, um, you know, which is a real uh, national scandal, an abuse of human rights, and a source of great tension internationally for the uh, uh, torture and uh, human rights violations that are taking place at Gitmo. Our next question is from Jim Peterson, who says, what are your plans to help the homeless, especially homeless vets? Great question, uh, Jim. There's so much that we can do for the homeless, and there's so much we can do for vets. Uh, we have more empty homes right now than we have homeless people. So we need to bring those homes back into use. We can put people to work and create jobs by rehabbing those homes uh, where necessary so that they again become habitable. And uh, we need to put communities back in charge of their housing rather than developers who are building housing for profit. We need to ensure we have housing for people. Our next question is, um, oops, um, hold on. <laughs> uh, our next question is from um, David D. Phillips, who says, hey, Jill, do you have any suggestions moving forward as to how we might get rid of the Commission on Presidential Debates, or at least its arbitrary 15% rule? We do need to get rid of the arbitrary Commission on Presidential Debates and its intentional use of the 15% rule to silence political opposition. In the words of the League of Women Voters, this commission is a fraud being perpetrated on the American voter. The Democratic and Republican parties should not be put in charge of managing and essentially censoring the debate. We need to challenge their legitimacy, which is what our campaign is doing. I encourage you to support this movement to end the Commission on presidential debates. Okay. Our next question is from Paul Driver who says, hey Jill, what are your thoughts on worker co-ops? Thanks Paul. Uh, worker co-ops are uh, essential. They're a very important part of the economy. Uh, we would establish uh, a, an office of the cooperative economy in order to help uh, teach people and provide the skills for establishing uh, worker cooperatives. We would make funding available to them because right now it's very hard for them uh, to get the capital they need in order to start up. This is an important sector of the economy that we need to support. Great. Um, the next two questions I'm going to combine. The first one is from Daniel Dye who says, do you think Obamacare was a good idea? And we're going to combine that with um, a, a question from Jameson Weaver, who says, hey, Jill, what would you do to improve our health care system in the United States? So um, to improve the health care system in the United States, we need health care for people, not for profit. Uh, there were some good things that happened under Obamacare, but there were some very bad things as well. It gave a monopoly, essentially, to insurance companies and to pharmaceutical companies, which are ripping us off for almost half a trillion dollars a year. We need an improved Medicare for all system to put our health care dollars into health care. Our next question is from Jane Doe, who says, hey, Jill, would you pardon Chelsea Manning? Uh, the answer is very simple. Yes, Chelsea Manning is a hero for exposing uh, the crimes and the lies uh, and the international law violations uh, that was being committed by our government in our name. We deserve to know uh, what our government is doing, especially by way of war and war crimes, uh, and he enabled us to stop it. So he should be, I'm sorry, she should be um, 
uh, pardoned and brought back a hero. Um, our next question is from Monica, who says, hey Jill, if you were elected, what would you tackle in the first 100 days? What we could tackle very quickly, in fact, is to break up the big banks by using um, Bill Black's uh, recommended um, uh, initiatives to uh, break them up. Bill Black, who wrote the book, The Best Way to Rob a Bank uh, is to Own One. Uh, we would also instruct the Drug Enforcement Agency to use science and to take marijuana and hemp off of the list of scheduled substances. Our next question is from Mindy Smith, who is running as a Green in California. And her question says, talk about ranked choice voting. How does it work? Thank you, Mindy, for bringing that up. Ranked choice voting, very important. Anybody who's worried about spoiling the election, and you're probably you know, in touch with people who are uh, complaining about that. We have a solution. It's just fix the voting system. Uh, the solution to a compromised democracy is not less democracy. <laughs> Silencing the voices of political opposition is not democracy, that's tyranny. We need ranked choice voting. It lets you rank your choices. If your first loses, your vote's reassigned to your second choice. Our next question is from Domenico Di Salvo, who says, Hey Jill, how do we get more congressional support for the party and get Congress people who support your vision of the future? The good news, Domenico, is that there are scores of Greens who are running for Congress right now. And one of the things our campaign is doing is lifting the veil and shining the light on these wonderful down-ballot candidates, not only for Congress, but at all levels of government. And uh, get out and support them, work for them. Uh, we need to bring them into Congress at the same time that we are heading for the White House. And the more of us that go to D.C., the sooner we will get it cleaned up. Thank you. Our next question is from Lori Lamb, who says, Hey, Jill, can you speak about Bernie Sanders supporters and if they are welcome to your campaign? Yes, and let me give a big uh, welcome and thank you to all of the Bernie supporters uh, who stood up for a better vision of America that works for working people and who refused to be silenced or intimidated by the Democratic Party. So thank you for building this movement and thank you for continuing this movement. Uh, this is a very powerful coalition for the Bernie passion to be meeting the Green Party infrastructure. Together we're unstoppable. Our next question is from Ashley Nicole, who says, Hey Jill, what are your plans to improve mental health availability as president? Mental health. Mental health is absolutely critical. It should be a routine part of uh, health insurance, and it would be covered completely uh, under a improved Medicare for All system, which is what we are supporting. We should be covered head to toe, cradle to grave, not only physical health, but mental health. Uh, as well as reproductive health, your pharmaceuticals, your hearing aid, whatever you need, this should be covered. Mental health is critical to our health. Our next question uh, is uh, from the Kobe system, who says, what is your stance on the war on drugs? Uh, the war on drugs is a, um, uh, is a very is a failure. <laughs> it's a failure and it's a very bad thing. Uh, I will end the war on drugs. We will treat uh, drug use as a health issue, not as a criminal issue. And the first step is to legalize marijuana and hemp uh, and to actually pardon all those people who are wrongly incarcerated in the first place for using a substance which is actually safer than alcohol and nicotine. Our next question is from Sean C. Gay, who says, Hey Jill, how can we reclaim the institution of scientific research from undue corporate interest? Great. Uh, wonderful question, Sean. How can we get corporate interests out of the business of defining our, uh, our research institutions and our research goals? Um, there are many ways. Uh, for one thing, we need to stop the revolving door between our regulatory agencies and the corporations they're supposed to be regulating. Also, we need to get money out of politics, and that's not so hard to do. It's time for a fully publicly financed system of elections and to free the media so the airwaves uh, are free for our use. Our next question is from Raghu, 
And he says, hey, Jill, can you address food, agriculture, and farmers and what you would do? So uh, we need to restore our farming economy, our farming families, our farming communities, and to take back the institution of farming from uh, corporate America, which has degraded it, which has poisoned it, which has created a food system, an industrial food system that is bad for farmers, farm workers, communities, uh, the planet, and consumers who are eating it. We need a healthy, organic, and sustainable food system. Um, our next question here is from Nkoku Yokohama, who says, hey, Jill, what would you do to make a path to citizenship easier for immigrants like myself? Great. Um, so we need a welcoming path to citizenship for the immigrants who've actually been at the foundation of our economies, our community, uh, and our uh, culture. And um, we need to uh, address the crisis of immigration by stopping uh, the things that are causing it in the first place, namely NAFTA, the war on drugs, and by invading other countries and undermining democracies. Our next question is from, from Danielle Myers, who says, hey, Jill, how will you help Puerto Rico? Uh, so Puerto Rico needs to be liberated from the colonial status uh, that has been inflicted on it for uh, centuries. Yes. And immediately, the first step uh, is for us to bail out uh, Puerto Rico uh, as a repayment for the incredible resources, uh, um, uh, human skills and labor that have been extracted from Puerto Rico uh, by uh, U.S. corporations that have been able to relocate there. Our next question is from Steve Alish, who says, Hey, Jill, do you support publicly financed elections, and how would you make that happen? Yes, we need publicly financed elections. Hand in hand, we also need to liberate the airwaves, because the minute uh, candidates have free access to the public airwaves, then the cost of campaigning takes a nosedive, and then it's very affordable for us to have publicly funded elections. And I would get private money, whether it is the money of, of a billionaire funding himself or the money of billionaires funding their candidates to do work for them. We need to get private money out so we can get the people back in. Um, and our next question it comes from Memphis, and, it's, and they say, hey, Jill, what can we do to keep the revolution going after the election? Thank you. Um, we need to stick together and to stay together because the work has only be begun. Whether we're in the White House or whether we are outside of the White House, we are building and we've taken an incredible leap forward in this election and thanks to all of you for making that so. I think we haven't seen yet how far we can go in this election because we're just beginning to see the word spreading, especially among uh, millennials who are really ready for a change. So hold on to your hat, let's see where it goes, and let's stay in touch. Jonathan Alonzo asks, hey Jill, would you free Leonard Peltier? Uh, yes, I would uh, free Leonard Peltier and other uh, political prisoners as well, including um, uh, Mumia, Abu Jamal, uh, Chelsea Manning, um, uh, Julian Assange, uh, and especially Reverend Edward Pinckney, uh, who is imprisoned in uh, Benton Harbor, um, Michigan, where he was imprisoned basically for fighting back against the takeover of Benton Harbor by the Whirlpool Corporation. Mike Ridgway asks, Hey Jill, what is your position on constantly sending more and more money to support Israel's wars while our people go hungry? Well, exactly. I mean, not only that it is, these wars are, you know, these wars are bankrupting uh, America, but also that this is a very uh, unconscionable thing to do. We're calling for an even-handed foreign policy where we stop supporting governments, even our allies, who are violating international law and human rights, as Israel is doing, uh, through occupation, through home demolitions, through assassination programs, uh, collective punishment, disproportional force, etc. Tom Wenzel asks, uh, do you agree with Bernie's economists like Stephanie Kelton that we have the money for free universities? Oh, absolutely, uh, we do. Um, and we know that for every dollar we put in 
to higher education, we get back $7 in return. So it pays for itself. What better investment is there than in the education uh, of our younger generation? This is long overdue. Our next question is from Jimmy Padilla, who says, Hey, Jill, please tell us how you will help the undocumented immigrants that are living in this country. So let me say, not only do we need a welcoming path to citizenship, we need to put an immediate end to the deportations, the detentions, and the night raids. Uh, the Republicans have shown themselves to be the party of hate and fear, but the Democrats are the party of deportation and detention. So the Green Party offers a new way forward uh, with a welcoming path to citizenship and respecting the refugees who've come here fleeing our misguided policies. We need to end those policies. Steel City for Stein asks, hey Jill, what will you do to make sure politicians and bankers that break the law are held accountable for their crimes? Well, exactly. Uh, the first thing that we need to do is to uh, elect uh, representatives who are not being bankrolled by those very banks. And, um, you know, Hillary Clinton, we certainly know about her sponsorship by the banks. Uh, the Republican Party uh, technically has plenty of sponsorship from them as well. So we need to, you know, put our money where our mouth is and uh, support a politics of integrity that will do the right thing. We have time for about three more questions. So the first comes from Joey, who says, Hey, Jill, what factors would you consider in choosing a potential Supreme Court justice? Um, we need a Supreme Court justice who is free from conflicts of interest, from uh, historical connections to the various predatory corporate interests that have you know, compromised our court system as well as our political system. We need a Supreme Court justice who will stand up for women's rights, for immigrant rights, uh, for human rights, and who will get money out of politics and oppose uh, Citizens United and render corporations uh, not human beings. <laughs> Um, okay, our next question comes from Cyrene Cray, who says, Hey Jill, what are some of your policies regarding animal rights and animal welfare in the United States? So maybe the most important thing we can do is to end the combined uh, animal feeding uh, operations, the CAFOs, which are uh, inhumane and which are a disaster for the environment and also which produce food that has some um, rather untoward things added to it, in particular high levels of antibiotics, uh, because when the animals are so crowded together, it's not good for them. Uh, they pollute our water supplies uh, and our land and so on. So we need to end that and get back to a healthy uh, system of animal husbandry, healthy and humane. Jeffrey Stokes asks this question. Hey Jill, what is your policy for Social Security? Uh, we need to take the cap off of the Social Security contributions, because right now it's very regressive, uh, so that those contributions not only continue up to the top of the income level, but actually it should be progressive, so that the contribution increases uh, proportionally at higher levels of the income uh, stream. That way we can be sure that Social Security, uh, we can be expanding it, not worry about uh, having to contract it. And our last question, perhaps one of the most important questions we'll get in this election, comes from AKA The Snake, who says, Hey Jill, how can we end the two-party trap? By uh, supporting the alternative to the two-party trap, which is independent, uh, principled politics through the Green Party, uh, which is collaborating with many of the smaller independent progressive and socialist parties. We need to work together to be the strong, unstoppable force that we actually are. We need to stand up and stand strong. We do have the numbers. We have the values of the American people at heart. It's time to stand up and actually take our future back into our own hands. Would you like to say anything? So, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Jill Stein. All right. And if you, I, I just got, I just got word. Not one million, I can tell you. Two million people participated in this process. 2.8 million. We gonna do this again. Tune in on October 4th. Ajamu Baraka, Vice Presidential Candidate. Come on up Come here, Ajamu. Ajamu Baraka, we are going to do this again. 
I want you to join us, Ajamu Baraka, Vice Presidential Nominee. We're going to do this again, coming to you from Richmond, Virginia. Go to that website, jill2016.com. We need you to donate. We need you to volunteer. We need you to become organizers on social media yourself, right? Don't hate the media. Become the media. Peace, y'all. Can you clear us? Can you clear us? All right. All right. We're clear. Thank you, folks. Thank you. Everybody, please don't leave. Uh, we're going to do a photo shoot. I want my candidate. I want our candidates right here in the middle. And